Hello again, fight fans, and welcome to episode number 295 of the Neutral Corner Boxing Podcast. I am your host, Michael Montero, for Ring Magazine, RingTV.com, and the Ring Digital YouTube channel, where you are checking me out live right now. As always, we remind you to click on that subscribe button and then click on that notification bell so that you never miss a live video of the show. But in case you do, it's all good. The audio podcast comes out on podcast platforms around the world. Just look for my handle, Montero on Boxing, The Neutral Corner, and you'll find me. Make sure you subscribe, leave a rating, a review, all that good stuff. Uh, TNC 295 for the week of December 25. Christmas week. Christmas is upon us. Merry Christmas, everybody. For those of you who don't celebrate Christmas, happy holidays. For those of you who don't celebrate anything, happy whatever. <laughs> um, I just want to say, uh, well, obviously I'm wearing the Santa hat right here. And it's a little awkward because I got some headphones on. So, you yeah. know. Yeah, I might look like a complete moron, but you know what? I've never been afraid to make an ass of myself. I do it quite often. Uh, before we get started, we already got a super chat pledge from Feeling Dangerous. Thank you so much, man. He says, uh, well, listen later. Have to watch the Cleveland Browns lose because of COVID, but Merry Christmas, Mike. Hey, man, Cleveland Browns, you know, pretty decent season. You know, I think they're building something there. My Detroit Lions have actually pretty recently played pretty well. I mean, in the last, what, four games, I think they're 2-1-1, one, and one, and they beat Arizona uh, yesterday. So so that was big. That was real, real big. I really wanted them to go 0-17. I thought that'd be great. But they're really playing their hearts out. So anyway, um, yeah, man, I, before I get started, and we got a ton of stuff to review. It was a packed weekend, right? There's Pretty much every promoter was trying to jam in that last card of the year, right? We had, yeah, there was some showcase fights and there was a lot of stay busy fights, but there was also a lot of really good evenly matched fights that led to great action. So we'll do that full review. And then also I wanted to do um, kind of like a best of the year, you know, best of 2021 boxing awards. And, and normally I would do a recorded video and post something like that on my channel. But I want to do something a little different this year. I want to do it live with you guys because I wanted to get your input. I, I really value you guys' input, and we've had so much fun this year with you guys calling in. I hope that you've enjoyed me posting your quotes on the recaps that I post on ringtv.com the day after the show. Uh, it's been fun to post all your quotes and, and to look back on all that stuff. And um, that, that, which brings me to my next point, um, you know, at the end of the year, th this time of year, regardless of what you celebrate, it's really a time of reflection where you're supposed to look back at the things you accomplished, some of the, the lessons you've learned, things you've been through, and to, to be grateful for the things you've received, you know, the gifts you've received. And, and sometimes, you know, people think gifts, they think of like a physical thing like here's a brand new iphone or something you know like a present but sometimes a gift can just be an opportunity somebody spending time with you somebody supporting you all of you guys that are watching this show uh you've supported me w whether it's just through the show uh through our back and forth on twitter all the twitter uh trolling that we've we've laughed our ass off together we've also had some arguments and gone back and forth and had some debates um but you guys have supported me. I had a fight this year. A lot of you guys supported me in that effort because you knew what I was fighting for. A lot of you guys even bought that fight and watched it live. Some of you even bought tickets and attended it live. So I, I just wanted to make sure that I expressed my gratitude to all of you. It's something I don't do often enough. I need to do better at that. Just expressing tr how truly, truly grateful I am for all of your support. And I, I want you to, to know that it's acknowledged, it's recognized. And it's very, very much appreciated. All right. So I want to make sure I got that out there right away before we go any further. Um, another super chat already from Papa Chubby. <laughs> I love Papa Chubby. <laughs> What's up, Chad? Uh, thanks so much, Mason. Mike, Merry Christmas, my man. Hey, Merry Christmas to you, brother. Um, I can't wait to see the memes that come from me wearing this stupid freaking hat. Before I go any further, too, um, I should I want to share you guys or share with you guys. I did some trolling, some masterful trolling last week, and boy, did I trigger people. I triggered the hell out of Tank Davis's people. 
And I want to show you guys uh, one poll that I posted. I posted several polls, and they got thousands and thousands of um, votes, thousands and thousands of clicks. But this one in particular, I, I, I posted, who has a better record? Gervonta Davis at 26 and 0 or Vasily Lomachenko at 16 and 2. We had over 4,000 votes. I only ran this poll for a day. Over 4,000 votes. Uh, so it got a huge response. And somehow 18.6 of you chose Gervonta Davis. And there was even a, um, a contributor to Ring that chose Gervonta Davis and retweeted this with a quote saying that Gervonta Davis has a better record but lomachenko has a better resume and i saw several people spinning that narrative guys i have no idea how a fighter with shittier accomplishments inferior accomplishments in the ring weaker opposition uh weaker wins can have a better record than a fighter who has superior accomplishments, better wins, better ring accomplishments and accolades and awards and things like that. I don't know how that works. And some of you tried to get caught in the semantics thing between record and resume. It's all the same shit. And, and obviously, if you're picking Javante Davis in that poll, you're either completely blind because you're such a fanboy of, of Tank or you're just biased or prejudiced in some way, and that's a forming your opinion, or you're just trolling with me and having fun. But almost 19% of you picked Gervonta Davis, and I had a few of these polls, right? I had Davis versus Chocolatito, Davis versus Anthony Joshua. I just had a blast trolling, and most of you guys got it. Some of you out there took it as if I was making fun of Tank Davis or trolling him personally as a human being. That is not at all what I was doing. Who I was trolling was the spinsters, both in the media and some of the people in his management, Tank's management, uh, that tell us it's about pay-per-view numbers and then hide the pay-per-view numbers. Tell us it's about tickets sold. Tell us it's a sellout when it wasn't a sellout, when you were moving people from the upper deck down to the lower bowl because it was empty and it didn't look good. I know dozens of you that that happened to. Several of you posted uh, tweets with the screenshots of you know them moving you down and stuff as proof. Um, I'm I'm trolling those people and I'm trolling the fanboys that the 19 percent almost of fanboys here who voted for Tank, including people in the media. That's who I was trolling. I got nothing against Javante Davis, and I want to put this on record. I'm a fan of him when he fights. He's one of the most explosive, exciting young fighters in the sport. And yeah, he fights B and C level opposition, but I still watch him fight. Now, am I going to pay for one of his fights? No, of course not. Not until he fights actually, you know, top opposition. But I'm still going to watch. I'm going to catch a replay the day after or whatever it is and check it out. So I'm a fan of the fighter, but the smoke and mirrors and all the nonsense, just the 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 promotional trash that surrounds this guy. Uh, because there's so much double speak and hypocrisy and moving of goalposts. The goalpost gets moved so much. The fucking football field is just a wreck because the, the goalpost gets moved so much. That's who I was trolling. And for the people out there that only seem to pay attention when I troll Gervonta Davis's fans and management or Deontay Wilder, I trolled him a lot when he was going on and on about, you know, his forehead being dented and there was an autopsy and all that. Egg weights, I trolled the fuck out of that. And some of you really, really got triggered. But you guys don't seem to pay attention when I troll Top Rank and Bob Arum and Nico Walsh and the whole Muhammad Ali's grandson thing. I trolled that just as hard as I trolled Tank Davis, probably harder, honestly. And again, it was the same thing. I wasn't trolling Nico Walsh. as a, I have nothing against him. I was trolling Top Rank and the crew at ESPN and everybody that every 30 seconds has to remind you he's Ali's grandson, right? And I also trolled the, whole, the, the hell out of Tyson Fury and ESPN and Top Rank and the whole lineal thing. And how they just failed to mention the guy used performance enhancing drugs. The guy was a steroid user when he beat the, the same year. I won't say when he beat Klitschko, but the same year that he ended up beating Klitschko. 
uh, he was using performance enhancing drugs, right? We, we know this. And Top Rank didn't mention this for years, but had to shove it down your throat that he's the lineal champ as he's fighting Tom Schwartz. I trolled the living fuck out of that. None of you guys seem to notice when I'm trolling over on the other side. You only seem to notice when it's a PBC fighter or an American fighter or whatever. So some of you, it kind of reveals your own personal bias. Because any of you that follow me full time, um, and listen to the show every week and, and follow me on Twitter and stuff. You see me trolling everybody. Everyone's fair game, right? So anyway, <clears throat> just had to get that off my chest. Now we can get into this loaded fight review. Uh, we got much, 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 much to cover. So let's jump right into this. All right, guys. Okay. Uh, last week, man, we had fights on several different days. So Tuesday, December 14th, Naoya Inoue. TKO eight win in Japan, stay busy kind of a fight. And then in Thailand, uh, knockout CP Freshmart had a TKO five win. So both those guys defend their titles. Obviously, in a way, talking about top rank and Bob Arum, they've done a terrible fucking job promoting him in America since they signed him. Now, there's been a global pandemic. He's a Japanese fighter. Japan has been one of the more locked down countries. Uh, right now, they're, they're instituting more and more of that stuff with the Omicron variant and all that. Okay, I get it. But still, they have not done a good job promoting in a way. And I hope in 2022, they step it up. All right. Friday, December 17th on ESPN Plus from the Bell Center in Montreal, Quebec. It was Arthur Beterbiev with a KO9 win over Marcus Brown, who he dropped twice. Both fighters cut. Um, Marcus Brown, I'm just going to put this out there. And I told you guys he'd be a test. Okay. And early on, he won some rounds. And part of him being a test is he's a crafty guy that uses his head uses the forearms and things. He's a little dirty in there. I'm not saying this to put the guy down. These are just veteran tactics he uses. And he absolutely purposefully used the head against Baturbia the same way he did against Badu Jack and other fighters, okay? So they clash heads. And for uh, Brown, I think it was over the right eye, he was cut. He was bleeding too. He ended up bleeding pretty bad throughout the fight, but it was more so from punches. But Turby have had a nasty gash right in the middle of the forehead, fought through it. And I don't think he's getting quite enough credit for that because everybody was given Badu Jack much deserved credit when he fought through his nasty cut against Brown. I haven't really heard anybody talking about this fact that Baturbi have fought through a really nasty gash. And we've seen other fighters in similar situations find a way out. Not only did he fight through it, he stepped up and got his guy out of there. So I need to mention this because... Brown absolutely, I do think, uses the head. And after the cut was there, he was trying to use the head more and more and more. But Turbiev caught up to it. He changed his spacing a little bit. He got his head off the line in the clinch. He didn't dive in with his head down like he was doing early on because he, he was lunging in a lot. Wasn't cutting off the ring very well. He was following Brown around, but he's just a bulldozer. He, he really is a bulldozer. And he ends up stopping Brown with a body shot, okay? I think it was a right and then left to the body, and the left was really, really hard. The right to the body set up the left to the body, and that was that. Brown goes down for the 10 count. Now, a lot of people on Twitter were saying that Marcus Brown quit. No, stop with that. He didn't quit. Did he say no mas? Could he have possibly fought on? Sure. I, I mean, technically... He was up at 10, and he could have went forward, or he was with it enough where he could have gotten been up at 10 and fought on. But, guys, the fight was over. Look at, look at his face. Don't even look at his body, but look at his face on that second knockdown because the camera did a close-up. He was bleeding all over the place. His eyes were busted up. He, his face was swollen. He was breathing hard. He was in excruciating pain. The fight was over. He hadn't won a round since probably the second. I thought he won maybe the first couple rounds. But from that point forward, he hadn't won a round. And from about the fourth, fifth round on, it was completely one-way traffic. It wasn't even that competitive anymore. So by this point, what's the, what's the harm in him basically saying, oh, man, I, I'm done? I don't, like the word quit, okay? I, I think some of you guys, now, if you're, if you're just saying quit in a technical term, like the, the retiring or, 
or something, uh, taking a knee. Oh, okay. But I think some of you guys use that in this negative way, this derogatory way. And I thought Brown fought his ass off. I thought he showed a ton of heart. He gave it absolutely everything he had. He even tried cheating and getting a little dirty in there. He tried everything, okay? And I don't fault him for that. He, he wanted to win. But he was in there with a better fighter who just beat the living shit out of him from the inside out. Brown, I guarantee you, okay, is walking really slow this week at home. He's having a rough week walking around his house. But Turbiev got beat up a little bit, mostly because of the headbutt. But he's walking around okay. His face is a little best busted up, but his, his body's fine. Brown's hurting, okay? He's hurting a lot. He's pissing blood this week. So stop with the quit thing. But let's Again, I always talk about this with MMA fans. They're so much more forgiving of fighters tapping out over there. They, they got a tap out culture over there. There's no harm in it. There's no shame in it. Now, if you're tapping out or in boxing, taking a knee or whatever in the first round, or you're taking a dive, which we have seen, um, that's different. I'm not talking about that. Brown gave it everything, man. It was the ninth round, guys. So, so give the dude a break. I thought he fought his heart out. Uh, on the same day on the zone, from Tashkent, Uzbekistan. This was a matchroom boxing card in association with World of Boxing Promotions. Israel Madramov scores a TKO nine win over Michael Soro in a junior middleweight fight. This was somewhat controversial. A lot of people did not like the stoppage. It, it felt way, way premature. Okay, and I could see why. To his credit, Madramov said after the fight, I guess he talked to Soro in the dressing room after the fight and said, hey, man, uh, it's all good. We could do a rematch. Now, let's see if he keeps his word on that. But I told you guys this would be a tough fight. In fact, a few of you on the phone said that too. I want to say uh, Nacho called in and said that, you know, he he really likes Soro in that fight. So, um, yeah, I mean, the matchup was really good. And I think for the level of or the amount of professional fights and experience Madrimov has had, this was a good opponent for him. And I thought this was a great learning experience. I think he'll perform even better in the rematch. He had some trouble with Sora early, but he was starting to roll downhill. And I thought he was on his way to stopping Soro anyway, later in the fight, or at least clearly winning on the cards. So to me, I think the trajectory, the, the way these two were going in the rematch, I favor Majumov to win pretty decisively. Um, also on this card, uh, GSOF, I should say Shakram GSOF, 140 pound prospect and back to Mir Melikuziev a 168 prospect, got decision win. So that was it for Friday. By the way, this hat is hot. I'm burning up. So I'm going to take it off. And I realize my hair is crazy. Doesn't matter. This hat is hot, hot. So we're going to take that. Oh, by the way, I forgot to show you guys the latest issue of Ring. Take a quick break here and make sure that you guys see this. The 100-year anniversary collector's issue of the Ring We've had a bunch of fun collectors issue this year. This one's awesome. And my favorite part of this, and this was a story that I helped Doug Fisher with, but Doug kind of breaks down the different eras of boxing over the last hundred or so years. And he kind of starts, let me see here. So right here, the 1900s and 1910s, right? And then he goes through all these different eras and then it's the roaring twenties. Okay. And um, I helped contribute a little bit to this piece. I added a couple of, uh, just anecdotes and stuff like that that he threw in there. Um, but it was 99% Doug. But um, awesome, awesome stuff in here. If you're a boxing nerd like me and into the historical stuff, you guys would dig this. Make sure you check it out. I should also get over here to the Super Chat. Mike from Bensonhurst. I'm guessing that this is a Ginzoon right here. Mike, thank you so much, my man. Mike from Bensonhurst with the Super Chat. He says, not going to see Spence versus Crawford until 2023, if ever. That is correct. Uh, he says Spence is fighting Ugas, and Crawford is probably going to fight Thurman if Keith can get by Barrios. This is Mayweather versus Pacquiao all over again. Yeah, uh, so I should talk about this real quick too, guys. Quick tangent. Uh, so Errol Spence and Ugas, you did this Ugas, are going to fight probably in the first quarter next year. That's going to be probably a Fox pay-per-view card. So get ready for even more pay-per-views from PBC next year because they didn't give you enough this year. You're going to get a bunch and pretty much any card on Fox that isn't shit and even some that are shit are going to be on pay-per-view. Uh, maybe on Showtime, you'll get some good matchups that are not on pay-per-view, but on Fox, forget about it. It's just all going to be pay-per-view. But um, 
as far as look, Spence and Ugas, I get it. It's it's a it is a good fight. Is it pay per view worthy? I don't think so. But in this era, especially with that platform, I'm not surprised. But Crawford, I don't know if Crawford beats or fights Thurman. It's possible. It's very very possible. But Thurman's going to fight Barrios in January, and we all know Keith. He don't stay active, and he's probably going to hurt himself because he's been so inactive. He's going to hurt a knuckle or sprain something, and he's going to be out of the ring till at least the summer. So who does Crawford fight? He's going to have someone to fight in the first quarter, maybe in the spring, the second quarter of the year, uh, before he could even fight a Thurman. As far as Crawford, he's going to beat Ugas. He should. Ugas, you know, has a chance, but if if Spence is 100%, he'll win that fight. But who does he fight after this? Because Stanley Onis, who is the mandatory, he accepted step-aside money so that these two could fight. What I find interesting is that the same people that were just adamant that Deontay Wilder should not take step-aside money to let Fury and Joshua fight each other last year are now applauding Stanley Onis for taking less step-aside money for a lesser fight to happen. It's just funny the way narratives and goalposts get moved and narratives change. But, um, yeah, I don't know, man. Because I, I, after if Spence beats um, uh, Ugas or if Ugas beats Spence, they got to fight Stanley Onis. And PBC fighters fight twice a year at, at maximum. So probably what you're going to get in 2022, if I had to guess, is Spence fighting Ugas and then Stanley Onis. So I completely agree with you, Mike, from Bensonhurst, that Spence and Crawford ain't happened until 2023 at the earliest, just because of the situation right now. It is what it is. Um, all right, one more super chat. We got another super chat from Crisp. Thank you so much. He says, Andre Ward said Baturbiev looked weak, and fighters will be lining up to fight him. Is this a joke? Canelo will not walk through 175 like he did 168. Look, man, Andre Ward has always had this weird kind of thing. I'll just use the word thing with fighters from Eastern Europe slash Central Asia. He, he just he he just seems to be overly critical of a lot of them for some reason, and I don't quite understand it. I don't know if Baturbiev looked weak. He absolutely beat the shit out of a former Olympian, Southpaw, with a lot of experience and athleticism and skill. Marcus Brown is an underrated fighter. Um, the, the loss to Pascal, it, it, to me, was a complete anomaly because Pascal was cheating. He was juiced to, you know, to the gills. So I don't even really rate that. And I think he took Pascal lightly and it was just, there was a lot of shit going on outside of the ring because Marcus Brown is a piece of shit outside of the ring, much like Sergey Kovalev. They love to beat women. Uh, they have issues with women outside the ring. I'll just put it at that. All right, let me take back the beat comment. But they have issues with women outside the ring. Allegedly. How about that? But inside the ring, I think he's an underrated fighter. And I thought Baturbiev just beat the fight out of him with a horrible gash right in the center of his forehead that clearly affected his vision. Uh, to say he looked weak. Now, if you want to say he lost a step, if you want to say you looked a little sluggish early on and things like that, okay, I agree with you. I, I think Baturbiev is sliding slightly, uh, but looked weak? I don't know about that. Is Canelo going to fight Baturbiev? Not anytime soon. There are other guys he will fight well before he gets in there with Baturbiev. Okay, back to, back to the review. Uh, where was I? Oh, we're up to Saturday. Okay, so Saturday, December 18th, loaded, loaded day, right? So over in Kazakhstan, a couple of young Kazakh fighters, uh, Danier Yelenusov, why can't I say this name? Danier Yelenusov, I'm just going to say it that way. 147 prospect, and Ivan Ditchko, a heavyweight prospect, both got wins in their homeland. And in Ukraine, Denis Baranchek, who is a 135 prospect, and a, another heavyweight, Vladislav Serenko, uh, both from the Ukraine, got wins over there in the Ukraine. All right, and then over in Manchester, England, let's talk about this. Uh, we had some upset specials on the undercard of the rematch between Parker and Chisora, the rematch no one asked for. That's what everyone's calling it, right? But uh, Lerone Richards scores a split decision win over Carlos Gongora. That was an upset. People didn't see that coming. And then Kevin Lee Sajo with a TKO6 win, body shot, nasty body shot 
over uh, prospect Jack Cullen. Uh, so those were slight upsets, not major, not major, but slight upsets. So um, a lot of upsets on these matchroom cards. And look, upsets happen when you match your fighters tough. And I got to say, you know, Eddie Hearn gets a lot of shit, and I understand he is a promoter after all, and promoters are full of shit most of the time. All of them are. But he does put on some of the biggest events in the sport, which we'll get to later in the show. But also, I want to say there was more upsets on matchroom cards. And correct me if I'm wrong on this, guys, but I felt like there were more upsets on matchroom cards than any other promoter this year. Am I right? Am I wrong? What? Am I way off on that? I just feel like a lot of matchroom guys got upset this year. And I think that's because they do get matched tough sometimes. Not all the time. There's plenty of showcases. But some of their guys do get matched tough. So in the rematch between these heavyweights, Joseph Parker scores a unanimous decision win over Derek Chisora. Scorecards were absolutely awful. This was a completely one-sided shellacking. It was hard to give Chisora a round, okay? And I respect the fuck out of Derek Chisora. He might have the biggest balls, not just in the sport of boxing. He just might have the biggest balls on earth. Seriously, the guy probably has elephantitis. He has huge balls, okay? Respect the hell out of him. But I don't know if he won a round in this fight. I'm not maybe a round or two, okay? And the scores were 114, 112. Well, I'm going to name these judges because they're morons. Michael Alexander, 114, 112. Ingo Bar Barabas, 115, 111. And Justino De Giovanni, 115, 110. All of those scores are terrible. Terrible, okay? Especially when you consider that Derek Chisora was down three times in this fight. So Michael Alexander, in terms of rounds, actually had Joseph Parker winning. I'm sorry, actually had Derek Chisora winning because he had at 114, 112, he had to take three points away for Chisora being knocked down three times. So think about that. And then uh, the other guys almost had it a draw. That is not the fight that took place. So those scorecards are disgusting. And even though the quote-unquote right man won, I saw very, very little fan reaction from these scorecards and almost no media reaction. These judges have to be held accountable. Even when the right guy wins, mark my words, okay, and take this to the bank. These judges are going to end up fucking over the life of a young fighter that busted his ass and deserves a win and is going to get a loss and it's going to change his career and his family's life and his potential future earnings. These judges are going to fuck over lives in the future. It might take six months. It might take six years, but these judges will screw over somebody's life. Don't come yelling to me. Oh, we need to do something when it happens because I'm saying it now. All right. All right. Chisora was down the fourth, seventh and eighth. All three times, but mostly dropped from right uppercuts. Uh, uh, Joseph Parker's rear right uppercut was real nice, scored often. And Chisora would get dropped, and then he'd walk over into the corner. And it was Parker's corner. I believe, I believe correct me if I'm wrong, but I want to say all three times. He didn't even walk to a neutral corner. He walked over into Parker's corner and just kind of rolled to his right and waited. And so Parker would stand in front of him and kind of wait with him. And he'd lunge with a looping, almost like jump left hook that almost always missed one punch at a time. And he'd let Chisora off the hook. Chisora would almost completely turn his back at the beginning of the sequence, right? He'd get up from the knockdown, completely turn his back and walk away. And normally when that happens, a ref, that's normally a sign that the fighter's quitting. And a lot of refs will stop a fight if a fighter completely turns their back, which Chisora did three separate times. And again, I respect Chisora, okay? A amazing fighter in, in regards to his tenacity, his determination, his toughness. And he fought everybody. The guy, he is truly, you know, a, a lot of people talk about MMA fighters fighting everybody and how boxers don't do that, right? Well, here in boxing, we got a guy, Derek Chisora, who literally fought everybody. He's got over 10 losses. Who gives a fuck? There you go, guys. Here's a guy that fought everybody. Gabriel Rosado is another guy like that, right? Uh, Sean Porter is another guy like that. These guys fought everybody. Give them respect. Who cares if they won at the top level? 
They fought everybody. So anyway, uh, Chisora turns his back, walks to the corner, takes his time. And these sequences took 10, 20 seconds. So by the time he got the 10 count from the ref and then walked over to the corner and kind of chilled there, he got like a 30-second break. And Parker just kind of let him do it. And then it was one punch at a time. And listen, man, Joseph Parker, I like him as a person. He's a fun guy. I've interviewed him. Uh, I talked to him on the phone. We, we you know, I've uh, written articles about him and all the fun stuff he was doing on social during the pandemic. He seems like a really cool guy. And he has a lot of tools. He's a strong dude. He can take a shot. Um, natural, Naturally athletic, strong guy. And you need that in the heavyweight division in this era, right? Because these are massive heavyweights. These are big, big guys. It's not. It, it's one thing to be six foot four like I am. I'm not a heavyweight. There's no fucking way. These guys are 250. These guys are massive human beings. And Parker fills out that frame. He really is uh, a 21st century heavyweight. And he has a lot of good tools. But he has zero killer instinct. He uh, is not a good finisher. He gets guys hurt and doesn't get them out of there. He's just missing something. There's just, it, it's, it's, this was the fight where he had to show us, okay, he's going to figure it out and show us he's the guy that we think he is. Not that we ever thought he was going to be the number one heavyweight in the world, but maybe he could really give someone a good challenge. And no, he, he's just not that guy. He, he's, he's missing. There's something missing there. And at boxing at the very elite level, it could just be one tiny little thing that keeps you from being at that, at that top level. He's not there. He's never going to be. He's, he's a perennial top 10 heavyweight right now. Um, there are several guys that are in and around the top 10, 15 that could beat Parker on the right night. He's that guy. And then on the given, on any given night, he could give maybe one of the top heavyweights in the world, a, a tough fight for at least a few rounds. But if he gets a title opportunity against Usyk, should Usyk beat Joshua in the rematch, I think Usyk boxes circles around the guy. Um, if he gets a, an opportunity against Tyson Fury, Fury will absolutely beat the brakes off of him. Uh, I think that he can beat guys like Luis Ortiz and, and Deontay Wilder because those guys are overrated. But also at the same time, if Ortiz lands flush or Wilder lands flush, they could beat Parker. I think Andy Ruiz in a rematch with Parker, 50-50, 50-50. So again, we, with the heavyweight division guys, there are about three top heavyweights. Really, it's two top guys, but you know, three, maybe four, and then it's the field, and they're really pretty much all interchangeable. And Parker's just one of those guys. So whether you rate Parker fourth, fifth in the division, or ninth or tenth, really doesn't matter. It, it's it's honestly those numbers are interchangeable at this point. And I'm not trying to say this to diss Parker. But that's just the reality of where he is. Okay, uh, let's go to San Antonio, Texas, where his Golden Boy promotion's on the zone. And on the undercard, Lamont Roach got a good W. And female champion, Sinesia Estrada at 108 and Marlon Esparza at 112, they got Ws, defended their title belts. In the main event, Gilberto Ramirez, TKO 10 win over Unieski Gonzalez. And this was a WBA light heavyweight eliminator. So, Zerto is now in line to face Dimitri Bivol next year. I hope, and I do believe, I, uh, I I, really honestly think that a fight between Zerto and Bivol gets done for the first half of 2022. And I like that fight because I think Ramirez is going to force Bivol to fight. And Bivol, with his footwork and athleticism, is going to force Zerto to dig down a little bit more than he normally has to. So I just think that these two guys really, really need each other. Like super, super bad need each other. And uh, when they finally fight next year, that's going to be a matchup where that's going to be another one though, where we're going to look and we're going to be like, okay, one of these two guys has to show us something that they're at that extra level. They have to go above and beyond and show us that they are who we think they are. I'm really interested in that matchup because I think there's a chance, and there's a chance for Zerto, and there's a chance for Bevel to show us that they are that guy in that fight. And that, you know, it takes that sort of matchup to pull it out of them because Zerto's underperformed and Bevel's underperformed. Now, Bevel's fought better opposition. 
He has better wins. Okay. And I think he has more tools and I favor him to win that fight. But at the same time, I can't remember who brought this up. Uh, somebody on Twitter this week brought up um, Beevil's fight with Joe Smith, where he was just dominating that fight. And then late in the fight, Joe Smith nailed him with a hard shot. And he had to coast and hang on for the last round or so of that fight with Smith. He still won wide because he had built such a big lead, but he was clearly hurt late. And he hasn't quite been the same guy since that moment. Did Joe Smith change him? Did he get nailed with such a big shot that it changed him as a fighter? We've seen that sort of thing before. Um, I don't know. I really don't know, but we'll find out. And I think Zerto is going to pull it out of him. And I also think Beevil is going to pull out a little passion out of Zerto Ramirez. I'm looking forward to that fight. All right, guys, one more for last Saturday uh, from the Amelie Arena in Tampa, Florida. Most valuable promotions. Apparently, there were 16,865 fans in attendance for this fight on Showtime pay-per-view because, hey, what's another pay-per-view from Showtime? Uh, and before I get to the main event, Amanda Serrano fighting in a lightweight non-title fight wins. And apparently, there's talk, real talk, that Amanda Serrano and Katie Taylor will fight next year. That is one of the biggest fights in female boxing history in a pound-for-pound -pound boxing nerd sense. It's a fantastic matchup, and I think the winner of that fight is the undisputed consensus, pound-for-pound, -pound, number one female fighter in the world, okay? I really hope Jake Paul can get that done because he represents Amanda Serrano now. In the main event, Jake Paul improves the 5-0 and with a knockout win over Tyron Woodley. This was, of course, a rematch, and this was a cruiserweight fight. I think Paul came in like 190. Woodley was right around that weight too. And this was the fourth fight for Paul in 2021 in his fourth knockout. So Jake Paul, and I tweeted about this and I posted it on Instagram too. You know, when Jake Paul first started fighting, I was trolling hard. I was going hard at him like anybody else, right? Like I, I said at the top of the show how I love to troll. And I was going hard at Jake Paul because I didn't get it. I thought it was an absolute circus shit show. Well, he has surprised me a little bit. He has impressed me. Now, I want to make sure I level set, okay? Because he's yet to fight an actual boxer. So when there are people out there saying he's the prospect of the year or a fight of the year contender or even a knockout of the year contender, guys, pump the brakes. I think he fits into a special category because here's the thing. If you want to say he's prospect of the year because he's fighting experienced professional fighters who have been in the cage and they know how to fight, right? And these are real athletes and, and experienced fighters. I hear all that. They're not boxers. Tyrone Woodley, would he be a top 100 cruiserweight if he really was a boxer? Maybe, maybe. Would he be top 50? Not even close, right? Let, let, let's be honest. And, and if he squeezed down to 175, I don't think he could, but let's say he, he did, he wouldn't be in the top 50 or so in that division either. So he, he's not a boxer. So it looked really impressive, the knockout. It was and, and another thing. It wasn't a fucking dive. Will you people stop with that? The whole dive crowd. There's a lot of you out there that just, whenever a fight doesn't go the way you think it should have went, you think it's a dive. You think it's a fix. No, maybe you were just wrong. And so there's the conspiracy theory dive people. And then, and I'm going to go on a little, little, little bit of a rant here about MMA fans. And I want to make this clear because I respect UFC, MMA fighters. It's two different sports, guys. And just because your guy is a quote unquote good striker over in that sport doesn't mean they know what the fuck they're doing when it comes to people who punch for a living. And by the way, if Jake Paul got into a cage with Woodley, we know what would happen. I'm not trying to pretend, but you don't see a lot of boxing fans saying, oh shit, Canelo could go fight. Usman right now in the cage and he'd, he'd tackle him real quick because he wrestled, you know, for a few weeks in high school. You just don't see people saying shit like that over here on this side of the, the aisle. 
but I constantly see these posts and I retweet them. I send them to bad boxing takes on Twitter of people saying, oh, this guy could get in the ring and, and, and compete with Canelo. And this guy, stop, stop doing that. You sound like fucking morons. And you, you continue to expose yourselves as casual sports fans that buy into hype. It's like believing a politician because they told you something, even though they're telling it to you now at their campaign rally. But if you look at the record for the past 10 years, they've done the complete opposite thing they're promising you right now. But because they're promising it to you right now, you're going to vote for them. But if you just did a Google search and read for five minutes and looked at their track record for the past 10 years, you'd see that they're lying to you. <laughs> that's how most presidents get elected in America. Um, but that's what happens. It, 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 look, it happens in boxing. I trolled last week. I'm, 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 guys, I'm equal opportunity. I trolled Gervonta Davis's team all week because of the spin and nonsense that they're spitting over there. Okay, I'm not saying it doesn't happen in boxing. But at least there's people in this business calling out the bullshit. You guys over there are constantly sold something and you don't know what you're watching. Just enjoy the two different sports. They're two different things. Wayne Gretzky isn't going to dunk over Michael Jordan. Not happening. Michael Jordan isn't going to get a slap shot past Wayne Gretzky. Ain't happening. Okay. Stop with this. Tyrone Woodley did not have to fake it, or take a dive. He got knocked the fuck out by a guy who's a novice boxer, but has actually been training in a real boxing club with real boxing trainers and real fighters for a couple years now and takes it seriously 24-7. And Woodley thought because he's an experienced fighter, he could kind of get in there and learn a few things and compete with this novice. And you saw what happened. So stop with the dive stuff because it, it was a legit knockout, guys. Stop, all right? You have to get take these dudes off their pedestal in your mind and recognize they're going into a different sport. If Tyrone Woodley went into the NBA and LeBron James did a fucking 360 dunk nuts in his face and dry humped him on the way down, okay, that wouldn't be a dive. That would be LeBron James doing what LeBron James does against a guy who has no business being there. All right. Not that I'm comparing Jake Paul to LeBron James, but you get my drift. Okay. Now whew, calm down a bit. Okay. Jake Paul and his people know what they're doing. Very, very smart. They're fighting MMA fighters who are a little over the hill. But besides that, because there are over-the-hill boxers who would sleep Jake Paul in 30 seconds, right? He's fighting MMA guys because two reasons. One, they can't box. Two, they have name recognition with not the most educated fan base. Who is Jake Paul's fan base? Not the most educated fan base. They're YouTubers. They're teeny bopper YouTube clicking motherfuckers, right? They don't know a fucking thing about boxing or MMA. So when they bring over, they don't know who uh, Marius Bradis is. Let, let's say Jake Paul really wanted to go for it and fight a guy like Dorticos or Bradis, one of the top cruiserweight boxers in the world. His fan base doesn't know who those guys are. But Tyron Woodley, oh, I've heard that name before. I was at my homeboy's bachelor party and they put that fight on. Oh, shit. Yeah, yeah. I remember that dude. I saw him, you know, knock some dude out in the cage. Oh, yeah, that dude's a monster. And then they go, they listen to Dana White talk and, and the, the way that, guy, that dude's hyped up and, you know, he's this monster and oh my God. And they buy into it and they buy the fight, not knowing that the whole fucking thing, this dude was pulled and plucked for a reason. It's kind of like what Gervonta Davis did with Isaac Cruz. And now all the Tank Davis fans and Leonard Ellerby and Floyd Mayweather and Steven Espinoza and their protectors in the media. You guys know the names. I don't need to repeat them. Are trying to tell you that I saw Cruz is an elite lightweight. He's elite. He's up there with Cambosos and Lomachenko, right? Because of the spin thing. So I'm not saying it only happens over there. It happens here too. But just recognize what's going on. So 
what I tweeted about this weekend was, I do think Jake Paul deserves some sort of recognition. And that's why I'm talking about him here. When he first started fighting, I didn't even talk about his fights. But I'm, I'm giving you guys a lot right now on Jake Paul, right? And if you look at the thumbnail of this video, he's the headline. Some of you might not like that, but he was the biggest headline of the weekend. And I feel like he deserves some sort of recognition for what he's doing. So I asked you guys, if there was an award that we invented for Jake Paul, what would it be? Now, some of your answers were hilarious. I mean, some of you guys said some, there's some funny motherfuckers out there that I have on uh, Twitter and Instagram. But some of them, I think, were maybe not maybe not fair because I think some of you guys were comparing him to like Butterbean and some of these other circus attractions we've had in boxing before um, because boxing's had these circus sideshow things all the way back to like the 1800s, dude. This shit goes way back, okay? It's nothing new. This is just a, a different, newer version of it. But Jake Paul, if he gets the Amanda Serrano, Katie Taylor fight done, if, if him and Eddie Hearn could get that fight done, and he continues to put 16,000 butts in seats, and he continues to do pay-per-views that feature real boxers, not just him, but again, Amanda Serrano fought on this undercard, and he's had real boxers and some of his other cards, and builds, you know, bring young fans into the sport. I have to give him credit for that. I have to. Because here's the difference between Jake Paul and Gervonta Davis, and I can't believe I'm comparing the two of them, but I'm forced to because we're being told by the spinsters over on the Tank Davis world that the measure of a fighter, the measure of a star fighter is just if he fights on pay-per-view. It's not even if he sells a lot of pay-per-views, but if he fights on pay-per-view and if he sells tickets, he's a superstar. Well, guess what? Jake Paul is selling more pay-per-views than Javante Davis. <laughs> he's putting on better undercards than Javante Davis. He's selling more tickets. And he's bringing in more fans from a broader spectrum of the demographics of the sports fan base, okay? He's bringing in a lot of different people. Uh, I, I train, there's an LA Fitness, not, well, it's a crunch fitness, but it's like an LA Fitness here in Atlanta down the street. And I'll go there and lift weights when I'm not boxing. There's a few heavy bags in there. I don't even go over to the heavy bags in there because it's, it's amateur hour, right? I'm not trying to be a dick, but like you see the guys over there hitting the back and it's like, oh, oh my God, I'll, I'll fucking have a seizure if I watch you anymore, right? If I want to do that, I have one in my garage or I have the boxing gym I train at. But I got to tell you, I went into today to do deadlifts. There was three or four little, I'm going to be politically incorrect, three or four little blonde haired, little white kids hitting the heavy bag, talking about Jake Paul. Um, <clears throat> obviously, they have no idea what they're doing. They've never boxed before, but they were talking about Jake Paul hitting the heavy bag. And I was like, you know, I don't see that a whole hell of a lot. So he is, in the demographics of the kids, that's not even important. That's not why I brought that up. What I'm saying is it was so rare to see blonde-haired, little 16, 17-year-old kids talking about boxing and hitting the heavy bag, okay? It was just something you don't see a lot. And he is starting to make a, a somewhat of an impact. Now, the second he gets in there against a boxer, he's going to get flattened. Um, it, it Maybe I'll be wrong. If I'm proven wrong for that, I'll, I'll own it. But if he's actually getting into the promotional side of things and he can make fights happen, like, again, Amanda Serrano with Katie Taylor – that's different than just being the next circus sideshow act. That's different than being Butterbean or Mia St. John or, you know. So I will have to give him credit for that. All right. Enough. Enough of that. I'm sure you guys will have some comments about that in the phones now that I've triggered half of you. Um, but you guys get what I'm on to, right? Maybe I could have articulated it better, but you get what I'm on to. <clears throat> All right. Um, there's really nothing to preview, but I will say this. Um, this is the last episode of the show for the year, right? So um, there's a PBC show on Christmas from New Jersey on Fox. This is regular Fox. It's actually not a pay-per-view, believe it or not. 
Vito Magnecki and uh, Joey Spencer are fighting. And then, of course, there is a pay-per-view card on New Year's Day, uh, Luis Ortiz versus Charles Martin. The next notable fight, the next actual notable fight is um, in January. So it's probably well, almost a month from now, like three, four weeks from now, when Joe Smith Jr. fights Callum Johnson. That will be, of course, for his WBO light heavyweight title, Verona, New York, ESPN. That's a great matchup. And that's coming, I want to say, like right in the middle of January, okay? So we'll probably do a TNC the Monday before that fight to preview it and then to catch up on news and notes and everything else. But from now until then, we're going to take a break on TNC. Going to do impromptu videos over on my channel. We'll have some fun stuff over on my channel. We'll go live and, you know, whatever. Okay. So, so you guys can watch me over there. But for TNC, it's going to be a break for a few weeks. Okay. And then um, I'm going to jump to the phones here real quick. And then if you guys want to talk about the best of 2021, I want to hear your opinions. I want to hear your opinions on fighter of the year, fight of the year, event of the year. Event of the year may not necessarily be fight of the year. Those are two different things. Comeback of the year, upset of the year, knockout of the year, prospect, and then trainer. And then also I think a, a fun category might be performance of the year. So real quick before I jump to the phones, I want to give you guys a few names. All right. So for performance of the year, how about Usyk beating Joshua? How about Crawford beating Porter? How about Shakur Stevenson beating Jamel Herring? Those are all outstanding performances in different ways. And um, which one, you know, am I missing any? But I think those are certainly three that are up there. Uh, for trainer of the year, of course, Eddie Reynoso. We have to put him up there, man. And I know he's been up there almost every year recently, but he has earned it. How about Yuri Tanchenko, who trains Alexander Usyk? People talk about Vasily Lomachenko's father. Okay, yeah, he's up there, Anatoly Lomachenko. But he hasn't been training Usyk exclusively recently. It's been Yuri Tachenko. And I think he deserves consideration. Yes, even just for working with one fighter. Uh, prospect of the year, for me, it's a lock. But I'm sure you guys will have a bunch of names. But for me, I like Jared Anderson. You guys know I love the heavyweights. Jared Anderson is 22 years old. He had four fights this year. 11 and 0, 11 knockouts. And he's, I just think that he's the best looking American heavyweight prospect we've seen in quite some time. So he's, he gets my vote, but I want to hear you guys' suggestions. Knockout of the year Oscar Valdez versus Miguel Burchelt. That has to be up there. But Gabriel Rosado versus Beck the Bully. I don't know, man. I don't know if you can beat that. And of course, we have several others. But those two for me at the top of the list. Upset of the year, I got to go George Cambosis versus Tiafima Lopez because Tiafima Lopez was on the pound for pound list. Now, there are several other uh, upsets we can point to. But when you look at the stakes of that fight and where it was when it first got signed, right? It just, this top rank saw this as like a two and a half million dollar stay busy fight. And, and they saw Cambosis as a cream puff. It turned from that into this monster of a fight later on because it got changed so many times. It was like Frankenstein, right? It had all these different pieces. And Cambosis pulls off this massive upset. And then the way he's handled himself after that fight, he's made himself a star. Now, maybe it's just going to be 15 minutes. Maybe he's going to go on to have this amazing Hall of Fame career. We'll find out. But to me, that's the biggest upset. But of course, there are plenty of others. Comeback of the year. For me, this is pretty much unanimous. I don't know if you guys are going to top me on this. Nonito Donaire. He had that you know, tough fight with Inoue where he fought well, hurt Inoue, busted him up, but ultimately lost. He was dropped. He lost. And it was a grueling fight. And most of us thought, okay, he's probably done after this. Then there's the pandemic and all that, right? And then there's he had a delayed fight this summer and everything. But in between all that, Beats Ubali, takes the O, beats Gabayo, takes the O, grabs another title. And now they're talking about doing the rematch between him and Inoue, and people are on board with it, and including me. I want to see that shit. So I think he was the comeback fighter of the year. Event of the year, I got two for you. Canelo Alvarez versus Billy Joe Saunders. Not that this was some amazing 50-50 matchup, okay? 
but there were 73,000 fans in the venue to see two non-Americans fighting in America. Now, one of them is the biggest name in the boxing, of course, Canelo Alvarez, but the other guy was a no-name. No disrespect to Saunders, but let's be honest. So to see him fight, and what were the odds for that fight? 10 to 1, 12 to 1, some shit like that? 73,000 people show up. Also, Anthony Joshua versus Alexander Usyk. Have to mention that one again. Over 60,000 fans. That was a huge event. And when you consider the fact that between the two of them, there was four cruiserweight belts and three heavyweight belts. Seven belts now that Usyk won, right? So he's had seven of the eight belts in these two divisions. Um, just everything that was on the line in that fight and 60,000 plus people. Now notice, both of those events were Matchroom events. One was Matchroom, one was Matchroom USA, but they were both Matchroom events. And I think, again, that goes to the fact that people give Eddie Hearn a lot of shit, but he does put on big events, man. When he gets it right, he gets it right. But those, to me, were the two, two big events of the year. Of course, there were others. I want to hear your suggestions. Fight of the year. A lot of people are going to talk about Tyson Fury versus Deontay Wilder 3. I get it. I get it. Trust me, if that's your fight of the year, I understand, okay? But consider, this This is me, my boxing nerd brain thinking, that we really didn't need to see this third fight. Fury beat the living hell out of Wilder in the rematch. Um, and despite the two knockdowns, I thought Wilder had a good opening round with the stick to the body, and then he dropped Fury twice. I want to say it was the fourth round. From that round on, or at the fifth round on, he was pretty much one-way traffic. And the last three, four rounds of that fight were hard to watch. Deontay Wilder's career was ended in those rounds. Whatever juice he had remaining in the battery was taken out of him. And probably some years off his life were removed in those rounds. 99% of trainers would have stopped that fight. But he paid Malik Scott to let him die in the ring. That was their agreement, right? So. Because of the way that fight ended, I understand that it was dramatic. And because of all the, the hatred and anger from Wilder and his fans and, and even some of Fury's fans and everything, and the buildup because it had taken almost two years for the third fight to happen from, from the rematch, uh, I get it. There was a lot of thickness, right? There was a lot of drama. But if you just look at the fight itself, and after the sixth round, it really wasn't much of a fight anymore. And I get that Wilder did land some punches in the seventh, eighth round, whatever, but his legs were so gone. He was so sapped that they landed and they got Fury's attention, but he kind of walked through him. And the same punch that dropped him in the fourth, he just kind of walked through that shit in those later rounds. So for me, the fight of the year was Estrada Gonzalez too. Now, I'm a little biased because I love both these fighters. I have them both in my top 10 pound for pound. I've been fans of them for years. I've seen a lot of their fights up close and personal. But I was there for that fight, and I was so lucky and fortunate and privileged to have been there. And it was the first big fight I had been to uh, that had fans since the pandemic. So I had covered other fights. Like I had gone to like Canelo, Yildirim. And so I had covered fights for ring. And I've been to a lot of club shows around the Southeast. Um, but this was the first time I wasn't working that night. Jim Boone of KO Tickets as a gift to, to me and my wife um, because of some stuff we had done for him and everything. He got us some tickets and we went. And it was really, really cool just to hang out with fans. And like, it, it, I appreciated it so much more after it had been taken away for a year. And that atmosphere that night, we had to wear masks and stuff, but whatever. Uh, it reminded me of like those Superfly cards at StubHub. Like it had that feel to it. And in comparison to the Fury Wilder fight, the skill level was off the charts better, pound for pound, right? Because Fury and Wilder looked like two guys that were in a drunken barroom brawl at times. The skill level wasn't very high in that fight. The drama was high. But I'm a boxing nerd, right? So the skill that Estrada and Gonzalez gave us, off the charts better. And then the fight was competitive. When it went to the cards, you know, some people thought Chocolatito won. Some people thought Estrada won. 
The judges agreed that Estrada won. But the the outcome was in doubt. You didn't know who was going to get the decision, right? You're like, man, how, whoever you thought won, you it was up in the air. You didn't know. We knew what the fuck was going to happen with Fury Wilder. Come on. Some of you who are like, no, man, maybe Wilder could have landed one more haymaker late in that fight. Stop. You knew damn well that it was just a matter of time before uh, Fury finally got him out of there. So that's the difference to me, and that's why I edge Estrada Chocolatito too. Okay, fighter of the year. Then we'll jump to the phones, I promise. Um, there's several guys that we can put on this list, okay? Canelo Alvarez has to be the runaway favorite because it cleaned out the 168 division, okay? However, I would argue that there's this guy called the Tartan Tornado who cleaned out a division as well, 140. And the division that he cleaned out was much better than the division Canelo cleaned out. Now, it took him a little bit longer, and he cleaned out some of it in 2020. But um, I, I just think that his – you know, I, all right, I just – I just – was arguing in my brain. And I realized that Taylor's win over Ramirez was this year, but that was one fight. And comparing that, and it, it unified the division. It, and it was a better win than Canelo's had in recent years, in my opinion. But Canelo fought several times this year. He was very, very busy. And he, along with, I hate to say this, guys, but along with Jake Paul, carried the sport. And to a lesser extent, if you want to say Javante Davis, sure. He was part of it. He was in the top five of, of um, ticket sellers and things like that here in North America. So sure, we'll put Javante up there. But the number one guy was Canelo. He, he's carried the sport post-pandemic. And I think he has to be fighter of the year. Even though his opposition wasn't very good, he was busy he got in the ring more than the other top guys and the events man, 73,000. And then he had a good crowd for plant. It did what? 800, 700,000. Was it maybe it was 600,000. I can't remember. It was over half a mil pay-per-view buys when no other fight this year, other than Jake Paul's fights got anywhere near those numbers. So what Canelo did commercially and then his accomplishment of unifying and cleaning out a division, he gets fighter of the year in my opinion. All right. I want to hear your thoughts. So let's jump over to the phones. And we are going to go to LA first. 213. That's my area code. 213, what's up? You're on the show. What's going on, Mike? What's up, man? Uh, I'd say fight of the year. I can't go to Crawford Porter just for skills alone. Okay. That's fair. By the way, who are we talking and, uh, to? I, I didn't get your name, brother. What, what's your name? Do I have to use my real name? No, of course not. <laughs> if you're uncomfortable, no. I just want to give you credit yeah, for your I, quote. I still want to use my name. Okay. Oh, it's all good. I, I'm not in it for this. I just like the show. Oh, okay. Um, okay. I appreciate it, man. Other one is uh, for your lightweight, the Tank Davis. And uh, Loma Tanko one, mm -hmm. they're both pretty good fighters. One's just dangerous and a little bit sloppy, and the other one's just a really good technician. So, yeah, it's still a toss up that those two fought. Yeah, I agree. At this point in, in their careers and everything, yeah. I mean, I would favor Lomachenko, but um, Tank would yeah, have a really I good would chance. Have as well, for skills alone. Yeah. Now, uh, I want to give a shout out because I'm not into women's boxing, but the Strata fight, that was truly one of the more entertaining women's boxing matches I've seen. This. Yeah, she beat that girl up, didn't she, man? She dropped her, beat her up. <laughs> She's bad, dude. She might be the best female fighter in the world. And I've been saying... I'm on the ring ratings committee for, you know, the, the men and the women. And I've been saying she's a top five pound for pound female fighter for a minute now. She's bad. She needs to get more tests, but yeah. you know, that was an entertaining fight. I've never seen women throw like that. They're very technical, but wow. She's a slugger. <laughs> yeah. I seen her back when she was a prospect, man. I I've, um, I heard her and her dad and, and saw them at the gym and stuff before she really got going. 
she might have had like a couple of fights back then. So so I've been familiar with her for a while, but she's she's bad, dude. She's one of the female fighters that I definitely when she fights, I watch. Nice. Now I had a weird question. Why does it Gary the two Gary Russell go and try for the lightweight division? Uh, well, I, you know, Gary Russell Jr. at some point might fight Gervonta Davis. I know, I know his story. He, he, he wants to be the longest heavyweight champion. I'm not going to fault that, but his brother Antoine can do a pincer move because he just needs to lose probably three pounds to get into 135. And I really don't see anybody out there who can take him out at 135. I don't know, man. Um, the thing with the Russells is they're like a boxing family. Boxing is like the family business. They're all very good at it, but right. none of them are passionate about it. It's not something that drives them like in their heart and soul. You know, it's something the way me and you go to work and punch in and stuff like that's how they look at it. So I just, it's hard for Even me to like take them seriously. The whole family's like that, dude. The whole family. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. They're really good because they're they're boxing from when they're in diapers, they're basically. But I, yeah. Well, no, I so I understand Jerry Russell Jr. and what he's trying to go after. If he if he's good with how he's doing, I'm all good with it. But his younger brother is the prospect right now, and he can take out most of the people in 140, and he's going to be pushed sooner or later because. You talking about Gary Antoine, right? Gary Antoine. Yeah, Antoine. The thing is with him, dude, he hasn't fought anybody. So you could say, like, maybe he looks like he could take out the best. But, dude, like Ramirez, Pro Gray. Hold on. One thing. His amateur career. Okay. And who he fought in the amateur. Does that count? Of course. It counts to me. Of course. Okay, and the guy who he took out is really uh, one of the top prospects out there right now, you know? Well, he did He did beat Jerron Ennis. Yeah, but that was 2015. Uh, I think Jerron is probably... He did lose to Jerron, oh, too. Oh, no, Jerron bulked up. <laughs> oh, yeah, Jerron. Oh, he lost once? Yeah, he beat him three Jerron, times. And then he had to come back three times. He beat him three times and he lost once to Jerron Ennis. Yeah. So, I mean, that matters, but at the same time, I mean, okay, let's see yeah. how old they were. Jerron bulked up and has improved a lot. Yeah. But just in prospects alone, this is a time where, where he should be pushed. And if he goes one direction, then 135, and he dominates, he'll push people into the 130 for Gary Russell, his brother, to be able to fight at the weight that he's comfortable at. And it, it just, it makes perfect boxing sense to me, but I just don't understand why they don't do it. You know, that's just the family dude. And they just, the promotion that they're signed with, yeah. they're, they're not, <laughs> I, I, I think they're going to try to get Gary Antoine Russell a title at some point, but they're not going to be in any rush at this point. He's just a prospect them at all. Huh? Push pushing okay. him? No, they're not next year. He'll get pushed yeah. up a little bit, but he's got 14 you know fights right now in his pro career. Um, he only fought once this year, dude. Once. So he's I already know. falling into but the pattern. It's just is that more he can't get fights or no he's having doesn't want to fight. I think it's more they want a certain amount of money and okay. Y- yeah. And he hasn't earned it yet. Yeah. I-, I know the game. Yeah. He hasn't earned it to get that kind of money yet. Okay. Absolutely, man. But yeah. yo, I got a, I got a bunch more calls, brother. I got to jump to man, but thanks no, no, for calling. Go man. Do your thing. Thanks a lot, man. Have a good one. You too, brother. All right, let's uh, keep it rolling with the phones. I got a bunch to get to. Oh, man. 
I hope I can get to all these. Uh, Nacho, what's up, man? You're on the show. And I, by the way, Nacho, I saw you like that tweet dissing me this weekend. I saw you. I saw you liking that tweet. <laughs> you shit talking <laughs> motherfucker. I saw that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's hey, just Mike, Twitter. You sent it to me. I didn't. Yeah, it's I didn't, just Twitter. I'm not yeah. the one who put it out there. You know? But you yeah. liked it. But oh, you but liked it. Uh, well, if I did, it was on accident. I didn't mean to, nah, it's, it's to all like good, somebody's man. tweet. I mean, it's all yeah. good. I get, I get um, plenty, yeah, so it's all good. <clears throat> yeah, I was about to say, I think you would be used to like oh, yeah. having these jokers Hell yeah, man. point stuff out about you or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, just uh, real quick on like all those categories you brought up. Uh, fighter of the year. Um, I, I, yeah, by default, I would have to give it to Canelo. Only just because of activity and, and what he did, um, I, I would think that Usyk would be a close second, but that's probably the only two guys I think you could legitimately consider okay. for that award. Uh, comeback of the year or comeback fighter of the year, I think Donaire is probably the best bet um, for that one, just because he was counted out for dead, like you said after the Inoue fight, and now two years later he's on the precipice of being in a unification against in the way which nobody thought was going to happen. Right. And he's 39 years old, which is ancient for that division too. So yeah, I think you're right on that one. Uh, knockout of the year. I probably am going to say, I think it has to be, um, the Valdez over Burchell. I still don't see another one that was even bigger than that one, just because, uh, Valdez was considered the underdog and nobody gave him, a legitimate shot to beat Burchell, who was on a roll. I did. So I think that has to be. Uh, I picked well, Valdez. you were one of the few. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you were one of the few that picked Valdez. I'm just saying the majority picked Burchell to win yeah. that fight, yeah. including myself. So, yeah, so I think he, he should be the, the knockout. Of, the upset of the year, I honestly, I mean, I can see the Cambosos one for sure, Mike, just because of the way you explained it. But honestly, I think the biggest one, just based on the fact that nobody knew who the hell he was and he pulled it off twice, was um, Mauricio Lara against uh, Josh Warrington. That's a good one. I think that has to be the biggest upset because nobody knew who Lara was prior to that fight. Everybody just thought he was just some no-hoper being brought in so that Warrington could stay busy. And he went out there and he just wrecked Warrington's plans at 126. So... I think he has to be the upset of the year. Um, and then um, fight of the year, I agree with you. I think it has to be uh, Choco and uh, Estrada because there really hasn't been another fight that was on that level as far as skill and as far as pure action throughout the entire fight because most other fights that were considered for fight of the year kind of had lulls at times during the fight where – guys wouldn't really throw and they weren't really, you know, matching the activity. Mm -hmm. But that fight from start to finish, both guys just went at it. Like there wasn't really a lull at any point in that fight where you yeah. could be like, oh, okay, great. they took some rounds off. No, those guys just went at it for 12 rounds. It was awesome. Um, and then just real quick about the fights this weekend. Um, I'm going to start off with the, the my favorite one of the weekend with Baturbiev. That was great. I knew he was going to get Marcus Brown out of there. I never thought much of Brown. I thought he was a guy who had been built up carefully. And um, I kept saying that people thought that he had recovered from that um, beating he took from Pascal. And I just was never convinced because he had only fought once since that time. And it was off TV against some nobody. So I wasn't convinced he was back. And I was proven right. I mean, he went out there and he literally. Um, was fighting like a guy who was fighting to to survive, not to try to win. And Baturio just went out there um, and just took it to him and just beat him up and, and took him out. Um, it took him a while because of the ring rust, but eventually he did get him out of there. Um, I don't know what's going to be next for Baturio. I would like to see another big name get in there at some point with him, but it sounds like Bivol is going to be with Zerto and then Mm -hmm. Joe Smith is over here fighting Callum Johnson. So I don't know. We'll see what he gets next, but I definitely can't wait to see him fight again. Um, the, the worst fight of the weekend, 
the the result of it has to be Madromov against uh, Michael Zorro. Yeah, that was horrible. I mean, he literally got sucker punched like five times after the bell, and the referee did nothing to stop it. And then he steps in and stops the fight after he had gotten hit five times after the bell. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. That's horrible. Like, I really hope that they protest and they get a rematch against Madromov because I felt like that was a close competitive fight all the way up until that happened at the very end. And I wouldn't mind seeing that fight again because I think Soro had a legitimate shot to win that fight. I thought he was giving Madromov a lot of problems. And I just thought Madromov was really, really struggling with a guy like Soro, Especially which I kind of felt he he would. Yeah. yeah. So I, I kind of would like to see the rematch for sure with that one. Um, and then the other fights, uh, Zerto, I, I mean, he had a decent performance, Mike, but I think he made that fight harder than it should have been. Yeah. He, he let Gonzalez kind of tee off on him on the inside when if he had just stuck to boxing from the outside, I think he would have took the guy apart a lot earlier. But, you know, he got the job done and he moves on and hopefully he does uh, get Bivol next because, like you said, both of those guys need each other in order to raise their profiles. Um, with the uh, um, the other card, um, what was this thing? Oh, Morel. Morel oh, and yeah, uh, I, Fox, about Morel. I mean, psh, well, yeah, when are they going to give that guy some legit competition? Fox had no business being in there. That guy. He was just, you know, he was a patsy getting, you know, thrown in there to get blown out by Morrell. I think Morrell, they definitely need to put him in there against someone who's at least close to his level. I mean, he's waxing these dudes that have no business legitimately being in there. The kid has talent, but we won't really know what, how good he really is until they put someone in there who can actually fight back and actually give him a fight. Um, and then... Um, there was a, uh, and then, I mean, you were talking about it right now a little bit ago, Mike. I and mean, like you said, I hate to say it, Jake Paul, for some damn reason, has resonated. And like you said, I think it's a lot of these millennials and a lot of these Gen Zers are the ones that are, you know, making up his audience. I don't really think it's legitimate boxing fans that are making up his audience. But, I mean, it, it's a hustle. Him yeah. and his team know what they're doing. They're putting him in there against guys who have, no legitimate shot of really being a threat. And until someone actually puts him in there with a guy who can actually punch him back and actually hurt him, we all know that this is just a sideshow that's just being uh, sold to the public as, um, you know, this guy who's going out there and beating up on these uh, older MMA fighters who really have no, no chance uh, of beating this guy. Um, I was looking forward to see if at least uh, Tommy Fury could have given him a little bit of resistance, but I mean, we don't know if he was legitimately hurt or if he pulled out for some other reason, right. but maybe they make that fight. Maybe they make that fight next. And maybe we get to see him in there against the guy who's kind of on his level as far as being a prospect himself and right. see if he can actually take a shot, take a shot from a real guy. Uh, but yeah. Uh, yeah, Mike. So that's my call. I mean, I can't wait till you come back and uh, do another show. <laughs> It's gonna be a while, I guess. Well, I'll be, I'll do some stuff over on my channel, so just look out for me there, man. All right, we'll have some fun trolling oh, right. over the holidays okay. and everything, brother. Ha ha Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays. All right. Thanks. You too, as well, Mike. All, right. all right. And great calls this year, Nacho. And Nacho's been, you know, a consistent caller. He always calls in with some good stuff. All right, let's keep it going. I think we got Thad here on the line. Is this Thad? I think so. Yeah, Mike. Uh, what's up, there? Hey, what's up? You're on a roll today. Just want to say it was a great year with your show. I hope you made new fans. I know I've been spreading the word every time Thank I'm you. out at the casinos watching these pay-per-views. You know, you know, real boxing fans coming to the plate. That's why I enjoy your show so much. Thank you uh, so much. One man. thing that kind of stuck in my craw. You're welcome. Uh, from last week's show, you mentioned Nigel Ben is not in the Hall of Fame. I almost crapped my pants when I heard that, and. Uh, is there anything that could be done <laughs> uh, coming in the next year to get this man rightfully in the Hall of Fame where he belongs? He beat, he knocked out Iran Barkley in the United States in one round. He beat the best American super middleweight or middleweight, uh, Gerald McClellan. 
okay, in the most brutal fight I've ever seen, hmm. most epic fight I've ever seen. It and um, and also another very underrated fighter, uh, Doug Dewitt. Hmm. See, how he not he's not in the Hall of Fame shows that the Hall of Fame should be called the American Hall of Fame. I can't because disagree Darius with Mikul you, man. Trus- yeah. Chesky. Most of the the voters are BWAA guys, old school, and there there's a lot of American bias in the voting. It is okay. Yeah, it just is what it is. Wow. What an absolute travesty. And if you make that fight up uh, at the Turning Stone Casino on the 15th, I don't know if you can get there, but the Hall of Fame is right down the street. It's about two miles away. Mm-hmm. I might just go there and, and drop off a picture of Nigel Ben and say, here, <laughs> he's in the Hall of Fame where he belongs. You should. I man. swear, it's just crazy. You should. Yeah. Well, um, all right. My, uh, my main thing here uh, this week, since it's your last show, I want to get it all in. Um, the, the fights this week with uh, Baturbiev, and I, you know, we, we talked about it last week about the light heavyweights having a comeback. Um, I always thought that age is going to hit him hard. Usually his style of fighter, I mean, he relies on power, but mm-hmm. it's timing and precision as well with it. He really impressed me because he went to the body. I mean, this guy's pressure is unlike anything I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. He beat Marcus Brown down after he got headbutted in the worst way since I saw a prime James Tony get whacked by a Timmy Littles. It was on the undercard of De La Hoya, uh, Jimmy Bredal in the auditorium in, uh, California, go figure how, how my memory works. Uh, Tony came back and he knocked him out when he was bleeding prof- profusely from a headbutt. That's right. Uh, but Turbiev, Yeah. Yeah. Somebody and, tweeted and, out and a James video Tony, of that this weekend. Yeah, it's very similar. Oh, did yeah. they? Yeah, very similar. And Tony made his bones. That's when he became a hardcore, uh, like, like me. I started saying, wow, James Tony is the real deal. This guy. You know, he came back from that. And and Baturbiev had that huge cut just like Badu Jack had. Yep. And it says something about Marcus, yeah, how he headbutts his opponents in an Andre Ward-like fashion. It's, it's like a slashing motion. I swear he's been training with Andre Ward. <laughs> and that split head in the middle, Baturbiev was bleeding profusely. It was a deep cut. And he was, and when you're losing blood in a boxing match, that's oxygen coming out of your body. You have a serious disadvantage. That's why Meldrick Taylor faded against Chavez so, the way he did. You're losing that much blood. And the way he broke him down systemically and punished him, punished him to the point where I would disagree with you earlier when you said he didn't quit. All right, I'll give you that. He no mas, like you said. He, yeah. he got up right after he took those body shots. And who am I to say? Because that guy, Baturbiev, he hits like he's laying bricks. That's, that's the sound you hear. When he punches, it's like laying bricks. He busted him up. Baturbiev, by all accounts, should be on a pound-for-pound pound list. He's head and shoulders, the most badass fighter. I'm glad you brought that up, Dad. Right now. I, I, I'm glad you brought that up because yeah. so this weekend on the rings Ring Ratings Committee, I brought that up. that Because right. right now we have Fury number 10, and I said we should bump Fury out and we should put Baturbiev in at number yeah. 10. Every single response was in disagreement with me. Every, no one agreed with me, but I'm with you. I think Baturbiev okay. has done enough. In Brown and um, and Vosdick, that's two former Olympians that he beat the fight out of. Yeah. Regardless of how he did it. Yeah, Vosdick. Yeah, that, Vosdick wins a great win. And I think the Brown wins underrated yeah. considering <laughs> everything you said. Very. And I think he's number, I think he should be number 10 pound for pound. I think he's right there, but I was voted down. I just want to put that on the record. Please do. And I, I'll actually top you on that one because I would say take, not take Fury out because he's a hot fighter right now. Take out Errol Spence. He's been on the shelf. This guy's damaged goods. He, he hasn't beaten the championship level fighter since Porter, what, two and a half years ago. Garcia, he beat big deal. I mean, this guy should be off of a pound for pound list. He, is not the sixth best pound for pound. He's off the list. Put Paterbiev at number six. He deserves it. I mean, he's a unified champion. He's lineal. So I don't know what the debate is. But yeah, Fury could stay. But, um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, Spence has to be taken out. I mean, he doesn't even want to fight Crawford. And that 
when you don't want to fight a guy in your own division that's on pound for pound, you should be automatically disqualified just because of that. So maybe bring it to their attention again and go that route. Because I think that carries a little bit more weight. Because you never, Fury is way too hot a fighter right now, you know, to, yeah, to bump point. him off any list. It's a good point. Yeah. Um, so, uh, with, with J- <laughs> I can't believe I mentioned this, Jake Paul. <laughs> the funny thing is about Jake Paul, it's the spitting image of what Floyd Mayweather and Tank Davis are doing in boxing. They stressed all those parameters you made mention before about pay per view numbers, but butts in the seats. Okay. And they're cherry picking whoever they want to fight. Okay. Well, Jake Paul's doing the same thing, except better. He's selling more pay-per-views by a lot. He's putting more asses in the seats exponentially. And he's fighting the same competition. There's no debate. It's put up or shut up. So, you know, the people are giving you a hard time when you're trolling. I mean, it, I mean, they expose themselves already. A guilty conscience needs no accuser. Hmm. And it, and it's just that simple. So that's what I would do. I reply to them in that regard. And then um, another thing I mentioned um, shows back. It was John Abeck, Alamakuli. I hate having to pronounce these names, <laughs> um, but when he challenged Andrade for his belt, mm-hmm. Andrade automatically petitioned to move up to sixty-eight. Yep. <laughs> so this whole boogeyman thing, this has to go away. Andrade's a fraud. I said it out loud for everyone to hear. That's his biggest challenge at middleweight right now. Okay. He didn't want it. He wants to go up to 68. And guess what? Canelo's not there, man. He, he's gone. He may never come back. Okay. If he moves up to cruiser, he's not going to move that back down to 68. He's a big guy. He, this guy walks around at 200 pounds. He's going to settle down at 75. Cause if you remember when he moved up to, to fight Golovkin, he went to 68 first, you know, mm-hmm. to get comfortable because mm-hmm. he had a cut weight to make middleweight. So Andrade, he's grasping at straws right now. And now he's ducking a guy when he's calling everyone else out for ducking him. So I just, you know, I need to put that out there as well. Um, it, it's just the hypocrisy just really, really gets to me. And I agree with you on a lot of your, your points about fighter of the year, fight of the year, comeback of the year, especially Donaire. I was never truly a fan of Donaire until I saw him fight in a way. And he lost, rightfully. But the fight he put up against possibly a pound for pound number of top three at his age, amazing. And he's doing it clean. Yeah. He's definitely a comeback fighter of the year, no question. Um I, my my heart goes out to that guy. Um as far as prospect of the year. I give Madrimov a lot of credit. I know a lot of guys don't, but this is a guy who had eight fights and his record of opposition is unbelievable. It's better than Tank Davis. Um, he deserves credit for taking on a guy like Soro, who's a top six fighter, I would say, in his division, 154, a hot division, a deep division, and he was winning the fight. Um, he was up about six rounds to two, five to three, coming on. I, I think it was the referee that had the, the mistake there. That's, that's an officiating problem. All right. That was uh, not his fault. You fight until you hear either a bell or a stop. And I don't think the bell, you know, was that, you know, I heard it, but when you're in the heat of the moment, you can't really take it away from the fighter. So again, he was on his way to a victory in my eyes whether by stoppage or decision, but yes, a rematch, you know, can and should happen. But, you know, on the level Madramov is on now, you don't know what, what kind of schedule they have with this kid. He's 26. So I give him prospect of the year, the, the, the level of opposition he's fighting. And, you know, Anderson, yeah. I mean, he's fighting, he's beating guys he should beat. And it's, it's interesting seeing an American heavyweight because they're, they kind of like, uh, you know, they're unicorns right now. They, they're, they're nowhere yeah. to be found. And you know, yeah, here we have one and you know, it is interesting, but you know, it'll be, when he steps up, that's going to be the true test. I, I like, uh, Agreed. Jalav, the, uh, the gold medalist from the Olympics from, uh, uh, Uzbekistan. You know, I think he's the, the goods. I'd love to see a fight between them two prospects. So yeah, that'd be good. again, um, yeah, 
so I know you got a lot of callers coming up, Mike, but, uh, you know, I hope next year maybe expand a little bit. Um, you know, I love hearing the callers call in. I love calling in. We don't have a lot of, uh, we don't have a lot of airwaves for boxing. And I think the more people that call into these shows, I think the promoters and I think the managers are hearing a lot of what the fans have to say. Mm -hmm. And the more we talk about things like pay-per-view and what we want to pay for and what we're really interested in, I think we're going to start getting better fights. We're going to be getting better product because they're out there. We're the consumers and uh, they're taking notes. So if we express what we want and how we feel, it's going to be impactful in what we get in return, especially on the networks. And uh, that's all, that's all I have to say. So hopefully, uh, you know, you have yourself a, a fine new year and uh, you know, we come out swinging next year. Awesome, man. Happy holidays, Thad. Thank you for all the great calls this year, man. Hey, you too. Enjoyed it. Thank all you. Right. Yeah, I can tell you guys um, that absolutely several promoters, um, high-level promoters listen to the show because I get texts and I get calls from some of them sometimes saying, what the hell did you say? Because they disagree with something or sometimes they agree and they'll be like, hey, this, you're dead on about this, that... But I've gotten calls and texts and stuff from some promoters pissed off at something I said or something one of you guys said that I agreed with or, you know, so they do listen. Trust Now, some of them don't. OK, some of them decided they don't like me. They do listen sometimes, too. But I, I can promise you guys that several promoters listen and um, not just promoters, but like network people and stuff listen to the show. And I'm actually surprised at the amount who do, um, because I'll get a random text or an email or uh, a DM on Twitter. Hey man, um, you know, I'm a producer at such and such network and we produce this show and that show and we work with this promoter. I heard your show. Uh, can you go on this guy's podcast? You know, it, it, there'll be like networking things and stuff. And I'm just always surprised that like, man, it, it's a small world. The boxing world is very, very small. And, um, People listen. So definitely uh, make your opinions heard. You know what I'm saying? Because they're listening. They're out there listening. All right, back to the phones we go. We're going to do a couple more, guys. Uh, we got a UK caller on. How are you doing? You're on the show. What's up? Hey, Mike. Hey, hey what's Mike. up? Who is it? Hey, I'm Alex. Alex, uh, what's I'm going Alex. on? I'm coming from Birmingham. What's up, Alex? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Barbie and the one in England, not the one in um, Alabama. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, I, I'm good. It's normally too late for me to phone in, but I've got COVID, so I'm off work this week. So oh. it's all good. Well, um, I, I would say good, but yeah. that's a bad reason to be off of work. But I, I, I hope, uh, wish you do a speedy recovery. But honestly, it just this this new variant, it just feels like a cold. Um, okay. I'm sitting in the house, I'm drinking beer, I'm watching old fights. Cool. Funnily enough, Dad mentioned Nigel Bend. I was watching uh, uh, Ben Michael Watson. Brilliant fight. I recommend it to anybody listening to the show. Anyway, my awards for the year, fight of the year is a no-brainer for me. It's um, uh, Estrada Gonzalez 2. Okay. Uh, definitely the best fight of the year, I think, in terms of skill level. Back and forth action, uh, changes in momentum is easily the best fight of the year. And the only thing I didn't like about it was the decision. I, I thought Chocolatito did more than enough to win that fight, but um, we're going to get a third one next year, so I'm not too bothered. Um, uh, fighter of the year, I suppose it has to go to Canelo, but I feel like. Uh, Usyk, Josh Taylor, and Crawford got better wins and performances, but they both only had uh, one fight, didn't they? So, yeah, yeah. So it's kind of hard to give it to them over Canelo when he beat, I guess you could say, if you're promoting him, you would say he beat two unbeaten champions, so those, those guys hadn't fought anybody. Um, yeah, so Canelo... Uh, knockout of the year, uh, Valdez. Yeah, I like the way in the knockout you see him move back, you see him slip a couple of punches, and yeah. then just 
bounce up with that left hook. It was beautiful. It was a thing of beauty. And performance of the year, I think Valdez would have been in with a pretty good shot if what hadn't happened before the Contra Cal where he, uh, he got popped for, um, I can't remember what the drug was. Something, now, yeah, some kind of diuretic. I can't remember exactly what it was either off the top of my head. Yeah, yeah. So it kind of it kind of takes some of the shine off him. So mm-hmm. I'm giving the performance to Alexander Usyk, the old road warrior who's been to what Russia, uh, England, uh, everywhere, USA, and just he just beat uh, Joshua up by the end of it to the point where you're looking at a rematch, and even though Joshua has every physical advantage, you would you still favor Usyk quite heavily. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm still interested to see what will happen. Uh, I'd rather see Mystic Fury straight away, but that's not going to happen. Um, yeah. I'm, what else have we got? Upset of the year. Yeah, upset of the year. Where do you yeah. go on that one? Upset of the year. Count. I think Cambosis. Cambosis, yeah, because Theo was on the pound for pound list. But you could even, uh, I wouldn't mind anybody going with Warrington, like Nancho said. He, he came out of nowhere. And uh, Lara, and the way he beat him up as well. I mean, that, that was a bad beating. That was a bad beating. Yeah. Teal was at least a competitive fight. He came That's in and beat point. him up. That's a good point. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Ted Gal had another one, but I mean, he oh, yeah. Was, that's right. uh, he's at least been a world title. He he t- held a world title before, so he was no. It's not like uh, um, Larry came out of literally nowhere. Arsene Dora. Um Yeah, pro- prospect. I, I I don't really know. Yeah, I give it to. You give it to Jared or Xander fought anybody really to give it to him? I I don't know about. Uh, no, Prospect. but yeah, that's pretty much my call, man. Cool, man. Great stuff, man. And uh, enjoy your beer and uh, <laughs> uh, uh, continued speedy recovery and a happy holidays, my friend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Happy holidays, Mike. All right. Yeah, see you later. Ciao. All right. Nice one. So, as Alex from Birmingham, you know, he was saying that there's a Birmingham in Alabama, there's actually a Birmingham in Michigan just outside of Detroit. And a lot of people think of Detroit as, you know, this this rough working class area. And it is. It, even most of the suburbs of Detroit are like that. But Birmingham, and I have friends who live there, Scotty and Mary. Scotty is a former fighter out of the, uh, that area. And uh, Birmingham is really, really nice. Really, really nice. If we ever were to move back to Detroit, we would go to Birmingham. Not that my wife would ever let me because I have explored it. I have. I said, hey, we can go to Detroit. You think we got a mansion here in Atlanta? We could get a literal mansion in Detroit on the on the on the lake because we go up by Lake St. Clair, and like you'd have you'd be lakefront, and we could have a slip and a boat. And all. no, 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 we're not moving to Detroit. Okay, fine. But if we were, Birmingham would definitely be a place that I would uh, I would look at. <laughs> okay, so you guys, you know what? You convinced me on this upset of the year. I'm going to I'm going to cross out Cambosos Lopez. Even though I think that was a higher profile fight and Lopez was this pound for pound guy. Um Alex made a good point, you know, that was a close fight. I mean, Tio did drop Cambosos late, he made it close. So, when you look at Lara Warrington, Lara really did kind of come out of nowhere and he beat Warrington up to the point where I don't know if Warrington's ever going to be the same. I don't know if he's ever going to be rated as highly as he once was, if he's ever going to get back to that level. I think he's going to be different as a fighter from this point forward. And also, I thought I, I forgot about Kiko Martinez and Kid Galahad. I, I knew I was forgetting one. I'm actually forgetting a couple of them. But because I didn't want to go, I didn't want to like dive too far into all this because I wanted to hear your guys' suggestions. But with Kiko, um, he did have a world title before and everything, but what was so shocking about that upset was was that he's he's been so beat up in recent fights, 
And he, that win just kind of came out of nowhere. But Kid Galahad has always been a little iffy. Wasn't 100% sold on him. So overall, I'm going to go with Laura Warrington. I agree with you guys. Um, that That's the upset of the year. As far as prospect of the year, I want to hear some more names uh, in the chat. But um, I'm still going to go with Jared Anderson. And Thad made the point about quality of opposition. Madrimov has fought better opposition. Um, but I kind of already consider Madrimov further along. I almost consider Madrimov a contender right now. If he's fighting guys like Michael Soro, he's a contender, a baby contender. Uh, he's already there. He's past Anderson. Anderson's at the just completely still green prospect level. That's just where I see him. That's why I rate him there. All right, uh, let's jump back to the phones. We got a Canadian call. Hell yeah. We got some Canadians on the phone. Let's jump over to uh, 226. What's going on? You're on the show. Hey, Mike. It's Papa Chubby calling. Papa hey, Chubby. Chad. Chad, what's up, my man? How are you, man? How you doing? Not much. I'm... I'm good. Um, just driving, actually, funny enough, my two boys to their boxing tonight. So I'm in my car. So can you hear me okay? Yeah, I got you pretty good, man. Uh, and it's, are you in London? I'm in London, Ontario. It's yeah. close to Toronto. No, I know London. Yeah. You got to remember, man, I'm from Michigan. So yeah, yeah, I know London well. I've been there a bunch of times. I've been through that area on the well, way to Toronto. So. Yeah, my wife has uh, family in Windsor. And I know oh, you're yeah. from the Detroit area. So. I know Windsor very yeah, well. Look, uh, I, I won't take up uh, a lot of time. I just wanted to bring up one quick point and kind of see what you think or any of the guys think. But um, I don't know if it would be so much of an upset because the fight was a draw. But maybe performance. Um, I mean, I know everyone's got Cambosis and uh, Tio as the upset anyhow. But I, I feel like that Castaño and Charlo fight. Okay. Um, should get some recognition, even if it's just like, you know, an honorable mention. I mean, I feel like before that fight, uh, most people didn't even know who Castaño was. And I, I remember listening to a different podcast, reading people's comments, and people were laughing at the guy. Everyone was saying it was going to be short work for Charlo. And uh, that fight ended up being a decent fight. And Castaño showed a lot of heart, put in a lot of work that night. And I know he didn't get the win, but I feel like in in some ways that you could view it as an upset maybe yeah. performance of the year i don't know um yeah i just kind of thought i'd add to that because i feel like a lot of these categories um maybe not all of them maybe at least half the the it's kind of predetermined not predetermined who will win but i think there's you know each category has three or four nominations that i think most people would agree with anyway mm -hmm. what do you think what do you think about uh, Castaño and uh, Charlo, though? You, you see that uh, as an upset at all? I think so. I, I think that's a great suggestion just because, like you said, I think a lot of people uh, in the betting favor and everything else, it wasn't just fans. It was like you know, the Vegas odds makers were favoring Charlo. Now, I do know a lot of in, like boxing people that thought Castaño would have a very good chance. Um, so when he performed and, and a lot of people thought Castaño won that fight, I would say more people thought he won than people out there thought Charlo won. So you can argue the Bro, upset I, angle for sure. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, yeah. I, I thought he won that night to be honest with you, yeah. but, uh, but, uh, anyway, well, look, Mike, uh, I, I, I'm driving. I, I just wanted to, uh, call quick and, and also to say like, uh, love the show. Love the show, and I want to tell you that I listen to three or four different shows regularly, and I think what makes your show unique is um, the amount of interaction you have with people, but the amount of respect you give to people, regardless of whether you agree with their opinions or not. And in some cases, even when the opinion is a little bit out there, I mean, <laughs> you definitely are willing to set people straight, but I feel like... Um, you show a lot of respect for a guy with uh, as much knowledge uh, as you have. And that's what I like. That's more in tune with my vibe. So I appreciate that. And I'm looking forward to next year, bro. Awesome, man. Thank you so much, Chad. And uh, have a great night with your boys and happy holidays to you and your family, man. Okay, Mike, take care. Bye. You too. That, that, that was a great call. I, I love, 
Uh, Chad said out, but he said it like a Canadian. He said oot, <laughs> oot. <laughs> I love the Canadian accent, man. I was right there. We growed up, you know, so like it was just over the river. And uh, a lot of Canadians would come down and stuff to go to Red Wings games. And you could go up there in Windsor and drink at 19 and the strip clubs there are fucking awesome. So, yeah, you know, you go up there. But, um, yeah, man, I love Canadians are freaking awesome people, man. You guys are just so cool. Um, just cool, laid back and respectful. You guys are just awesome. Sam with the super chat. Thank you so much, brother. He says, uh, KO of the year, tank over Santa Cruz if you count New Year's Eve. Was that New Year's Eve? Was it? Hold on. Let me look. I, I, I don't remember that being New Year's Eve, but you might be right, my friend. Let me double check this. I'm going to pull up Tank's box rec. No, no, no. That wasn't New Year's Eve. That was... That wasn't December 31st. That was October 31st. So can't consider that one for knockout of the year. Was one of the knockout contenders of 2020, though, obviously. But he said, uh, Sam says, Ben, Connor Ben over Chris Algieri. That's another one. That's a really good one, man. That was a great knockout for such a young fighter against an experienced, you know, past his best, but a very experienced fighter in Algieri who doesn't get knocked out like that. He's been dropped, but he doesn't get knocked out like that. So that was a good knockout for Ben. And I, I agree with you. That's up there. That's a contender. Ben Algieri. I can't quite put it over a Valdez Berchelt, but it's definitely up there. And then he says fight of the year, in my opinion, was Lopez and Cambosis. You know, that's a good, that's a good one too, Sam, because just in terms of drama, fight of the year, you think drama. That fight had it, man, because you had early on, Lopez was dropped. He comes back. He drops Cambosos. Going to the final scorecards, both guys' faces were busted up and bloodied and bruised, and you didn't know who was going to get the decision. Most of us thought Lopez was going to get the decision. I know I did. I thought, oh, they're going to rob Cambosos. And then when he got the decision, you're like, what? They got this shit, right? Uh, so that fight had high drama. High skill, back and forth, both guys hurt, both guys down. So that's absolutely a contender for fight of the year, man. Good good uh, suggestion. Okay, back to the phones we go. I think we got Keith here. Keith, what's up, my man? You're on the show. What's up, Mike? How's it going? Good, man. Can you hear me okay? I'm yes, sir. Right yeah, I got you. Okay, cool. Okay, awesome. Um, off the top of my head, I don't have a, a lot for uh, tenders. I mean, I would say off the top of my head, I would say fighter of the year. I would probably lean towards Josh Taylor because things like you said earlier, I'm just getting on. I don't know. Um, he, uh, he cleaned out a much more competitive division than Canelo. Uh, he fought, I would say he fought. He has, a, right now, recently much a better resume as well, too. So I would give Josh Taylor the fight of the year. Um, fight of the year, it's kind of all over me. Last call, I made a good point. Uh, Cam, uh, Cambosis Lopez is a very good fight. It had good ebb, ebb and flow, high skill at the same time too. Where and drama, whereas Wild and Fury was very, it was exciting because it was drama. But um, they both Wild uh, Fury looked like he was not in the best shape. Uh, yeah. I mean, he was not able to get up. But they. Uh oh. Oh, okay. Um, you dropped yeah, for a second, Keith, but I got you. Uh, um, and as far as knockout of the year, I like the Burchell, um, um, what's the call? I'm trying to, I can't remember his last name. Valdez um, Burchell. That, that knockout. <laughs> Valdez Burchell. Just because it was, it was, uh, it was so emphatic. Um, and Monday night quarterback, Monday morning quarterback, I, I think Burchell was kind of a little bit overrated or I just think his fundamentals weren't that good. And you, for, for a fighter like a, a Stevenson or, a, or Valdez who had some pop and did box well, uh, he was a sitting duck. Uh, but yeah, those are my takes. I think I'm missing a category, but I would like to say too, um, just to say, you know, uh, your appreciate, appreciate your show. Favorite boxing podcast is actually my most listened to podcast as well. Uh, listening to another podcast by a very reputable fighter who recently tired, I'm not going to drop any names, <laughs> kind of pissed me off. Him and his co-host wanted to say that Javante Davis, they have Javante Davis. He has Javante Davis at a hundred top at 130. Fighters saying this, I'm like, what the 
what the hell are you talking about? And, you know, I just appreciate, you know, your, your objectivity and the fact that you keep it real. You give, you, you, you're, you blame, you'll, you'll throw criticism at both sides, every, well, every side, every promoter, everyone. And then you also give them equal praise as well, too. So, uh, I just wanted to call and say that I appreciate the show. We'll, uh, Will said this is the last show of the year. We're not going to get to have another podcast for another, another few weeks, but you know, it is it, it, all good things take time. All great things take time. So thanks again, Mike, and um, Merry Christmas to you and the family as well too. Thank you, and same to you, brother. Have Appreciate a good night, it. man. I'll keep you updated on other. Okay, you cool. Too. Take care. All right, Merry Christmas, man. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. I see here in the chat. Um, it was actually Sports Talk with Troy brought up um, Sandor Mart Martin over Mikey Garcia for upset of the year. That's definitely a top candidate. So good shout there. Boxing Learner brought that up too. Uh, that's definitely one. Uh, let's see. Coster said knockout of the year was Kyle Rittenhouse. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm not going to touch that. Um, what do you guys uh, said? Louis Arias versus Jarrett Hurd. So I don't know if you're talking about upset. I wouldn't call that upset of the year. It's definitely a candidate because Hurd was definitely the favorite, uh, especially when you consider that Arias had lost his fight just before that fight and lost his fight after that one. So, yeah, I think that's certainly up there. I wouldn't put it with some of those other fights that we mentioned, but it's up there. It's definitely a candidate. Uh, let's see. Okay, another super chat. Wow. Uh, from Miles Mahoney. Thank you so much, Miles. He says, Mike, fight of the year and round of the year. I totally forgot about round of the year. He said, can both go to Charlo Castaño? New category, robbery of the year. P.S. The real fighter of the year was don't or the real fight of the year was Donair in Oyoe. Yeah, but that was at the very end of last year. Um, but I agree that like last year, that was my fight of the year. Uh, robbery of the year. That's a good idea for a category. I was trying to keep it positive, but I didn't even think of that, man. We're too late in the show to go into that. Maybe we could talk about that over on my channel. Uh, we could do a video over on my channel, but that's a good one, man. Robbery of the year. Unfortunately, we have candidates in that category every single year, but uh, fight of the year and round of the year, Charlo Castaño. I agree. Hey, that was a good fight. Uh, we'll put that in maybe the top 10 for fight of the year. Uh, I, I certainly don't think it gets anywhere near the rematch between Estrada, Gonzalez, or even Fury Wilder, their third fight. But a couple of rounds in that fight were damn good. Um, also, I think it was round seven last Saturday between Parker and Chisora, just for the drama in the last minute or so of that round. I think that puts that, that round for a round of the year contender. I'm just thinking of a recent one. I don't think it was the round of the year, but it was a contender, probably in the top 10. There was high drama in that round. Uh, probably a couple rounds from that Wilder Fury fight. Probably a couple rounds from that Estrada Chocolatito fight. And you could even say maybe a round or two from the Tiafima Lopez, George Cambosos fight because of the drama there. I mean, uh, the knockdowns and stuff. So, yeah, man, good stuff. Um, <laughs> we got a comment here from one foot out the door. He says tank versus Loma in 2030. Yeah. On Showtime pay-per-view, of course. All right, guys, last show of the year. What a great freaking year. Again, I want to express my gratitude to all of you guys. You've been awesome. I've really enjoyed talking with you guys every week. We're going to keep doing this bigger and better things to come. So uh, enjoy the rest of the year with your family, your friends, your loved ones, uh, whatever you celebrate. Happy holidays. And you guys will definitely see me before the end of the year. Don't worry about that. But TNC will be back in January. All right. Until then, I'll see you at the fights. Peace.